Well, Dad, tell me about uh, where you were born and what it was like the time you were born, when you were born. We'll just go from there. Well, I don't remember too much about when I was born, but uh, <laughs> let me tell you what I was told about it. Uh, Mom and Dad were married on uh, the New Year's Day. January 1st in 1927. The reason they were married on uh, New Year's Day is that uh, my mother's mother, which would be my grandma Craven, uh, didn't want them basically to get married. And finally she relented and said that she would give her approval if they would wait until next year. And uh, so they agreed to that. But at that time they were able to make arrangements with the temple to be married on New Year's Day. And so they were married in the Salt Lake Temple on New Year's Day. That was unusual. Yeah, I think that it was not too common and something I don't think uh, could take place today. Uh, which was a surprise, I'm told, to uh, to Grandma Craven. Uh, basically, uh, um, my mother was uh, working at the telephone company, and so she brought in uh, some uh, financial help to to Grandma, and, and, and that was the I think one of the main reasons that she didn't want to see her get married. But anyhow, they got married then, and. <clears throat> Dad told me uh, a few years uh, before he died, we were talking at one time, and he said they basically only been married uh, a couple of weeks, and Mother said that she was ready to start a family, mm -hmm. and that uh, she wanted to have a baby, and so uh, you'll note that uh, my birthday is October the 22nd of the same year, <laughs> And so it appears that they didn't uh, waste any time. But uh, also from Dad's comments, uh, I was wanted, and and uh, I know that I look back on my childhood, I certainly always felt uh, that way. I was born in what they call the uh, Cottonwood Stake Maternity Hospital, which. Uh, is located uh, on uh, 56 South, East 56 South, in uh, Murray. And uh, ironically, uh, this is where David was born. The same hospital? Same hospital. And uh, where Mother died. Really? It was later changed into a nursing home, and uh, so she gave birth to five of her six sons there. Uh, David, our oldest, was born there, and then she uh, ended mortality there in the, in the same place. Um, we moved, uh, or the family lived in, uh, in Midvale, and... Uh, my father worked for his father who had a grocery store and a coal yard and dad's responsibility was mainly with the coal yard we lived on 44 depot street which was a little house that grandpa doll had built for for mom and dad mm -hmm. and uh, that's where i spent the first 14 years of my life uh, I found out now that it isn't in a very good part of town. It was down by the smelter and the Union Pacific Railroad Depot and the, our coal yard. But it was a place that I enjoyed. Uh, there were a lot of different type of people in the neighborhood. Uh, there were a lot of uh, Europeans, uh, uh, Southern Europeans. And uh, there was uh, in our ward a Mexican family. There were some Chinese that lived in in the area, but mainly uh, Greeks and, and Italians. And, uh, most of them didn't belong to the uh, to the church, those that had come from Southern Europe, but they were good people and I went to school with them and they were 
they were good friends, and as I look back on my childhood, I see it as a, a very, very uh, happy childhood. I, uh, <coughs> Grandma and Grandpa Doll uh, lived across, uh, just basically across the street, and, and uh, Uncle Lewis and Aunt Violet uh, lived across uh, Main Street in the apartment, and then when Aunt May and Uncle Malin got married, they lived in part of Grandma's house. Grandpa had died by that time. So the whole family lived there up until the time we built the new home up on Sugar Street. And uh, I remember that everything didn't go too well. I think uh, it was a family that was kind of too close together. Um, uh, uh, too close together geographically. Yeah. And, uh, but it was, uh, as I grew up, I remember my father was a uh, really a hard worker at that time he had the coal yard and he would unload uh, the uh, railroad cars uh, of coal as it came in and and uh, it was before you had uh, front loaders and and uh, basically uh, I know that uh, he could unload a, a whole railroad freight car in one day I used to enjoy going and delivering coal with him <coughs> in the truck, and uh, I also enjoyed uh, uh, going down to the coal yard. I remember he had a little target there, and we would go down and take a single shot 22 that I still have. It's still out in the garage. Uh, that uh, we'd go down and have target practice, and I remember Dad was a real good shot that he could sit a match there. And and he would light the match as he would shoot at it. Oh, really? That made me pretty proud of him. When I was born in 1927, it was uh, reasonably good times financially, but it was just very close to the Depression years, and so I was raised in the Depression years. And, uh, and uh, to pay the water bill, uh, Dad would take the truck, and it was before the city had uh, a lot of garbage trucks, and so he would haul garbage to pay off our uh, our water bill. And then also to help uh, support the uh, the family, as he had uh, quite a few kids, uh, he would uh, uh, haul garbage. And I, I remember he would haul garbage and trash for uh, Safeways, and uh, J.C. Penney mainly, and then there were several other stories. But that was always a big time to to be able to, to pick up those things, and especially J.C. Penney's, and uh, then we'd take them down to the city dump and uh, go through the stuff, and every once in a while you find a, a treasure that you would uh, lug back home. And so, uh, you know, growing up was a, a fun time. I remember that when it came time to go to kindergarten, and uh, <clears throat> basically uh, they lived what Mother referred to as the United Order, that Dad didn't ever have an income. And uh, he just basically had to ask Grandpa Doll for everything. And uh, she mentioned on one occasion, it was the 4th of July, that we wanted to, uh, or they wanted to take the family and go to Liberty Park. But Dad didn't have any money, and so he had to go ask his dad for some money, and he gave him a dollar and told him not to spend it all. You have to remember, though, that these were the Depression years, and a dollar would uh, would go a little ways. I remember the car that we had at that time. It was a little uh, blue Buick Coupe. And uh, basically, I think it belonged to Grandpa, my Grandpa doll, but... Uh, was given to to for the use of, of mom and dad, and so they they had a a home and they had a car and uh, everything was taken care of. But there wasn't still wasn't a lot of independence. I think that they still felt uh, dad felt like he was just a, a child and uh, and had to ask permission in regard to most everything. I remember also on another occasion that. Uh, they had bought a chair. I can still see the chair that was in the living room of our little home there on on 
44 Depot Street. And Grandma came over and got excited and says, did Papa know about this? And basically it appears that uh, Mom and Dad were kind of uh, trying to become a little more independent and had gone and purchased a chair with, uh, without permission. Uh, it, uh, uh, when it came time for me to start uh, kindergarten, I remember uh, it was summer kindergarten and there was a cost to it. And uh, I can still remember sitting on a stool in the kitchen of our home where I was raised and, uh, and that uh, uh, I was crying um, because I didn't want to go to kindergarten and Dad had gone over to see Grandpa Doll to see if he could get the money so I could go to kindergarten. And I sat there crying was, and, and was really hoping that Grandpa Doll, my Grandpa Doll, would not give uh, my father the money so that I could go to <laughs> kindergarten. <clears throat> but uh, he gave him the money, and I can still remember going up to the uh, Midvale uh, Elementary School, uh, which was on Center Street uh, at that time. And... Uh, going and how scary it was to, and to think that my mom was going to leave me. And uh, I remember that um, she was supposed to take some juice and so I can still see the sandwich uh, and, and the juice that was in a pint mason jar. And uh, on the way up, as I recall, maybe it wasn't that day, but it was one day that dropped it and broke it and how bad I felt. But kindergarten was uh, a good experience, and uh, and then as I started in first grade, I remember that uh, I had a real nice teacher, but uh, I remember that uh, as I think back now that there was a discussion on whether I should be passed into the second grade or uh, held aback because I wasn't picking up reading uh, fast enough, and, uh, and and in those days they would retain you, they would hold you back. That's kind of unheard of today. Mm. But they put me into the second grade, and I soon found out that in the second grade I was in the class with the slow learners. But uh, that went well, and I uh, got through that. And then in third grade, uh, had a wonderful teacher. Her name was Mary McMillan. And I actually had her for third, fourth, fifth, and sixth grades. All right. um, when got in fourth, fifth, and sixth grades, we moved to another building. They call it the platoon building. And so you had various teachers, but I had her for at least one class each one of those years. And uh, she was a great uh, teacher. She um, And she lived down where Dad had a service station on the corner of 59th South and State Street and Murray. The McMillan family was on the other corner, and, and uh, she knew Dad, and uh, but she always treated me real well, and uh, made me really feel like I was an important person. I was the fat kid when I grew up in school, and and uh, I took a lot of teasing. I remember being chased home several nights, and uh, and as I was. Uh, they'd catch up with me because I didn't run very fast. <laughs> I would get beat up and I'd look back uh, a number of times and thought that uh, because I feel I've always had a good self-concept and uh, but I was raised in an environment because I had took so much teasing and, and was so uh, awkward and uh, oh, I can still remember when I was in junior high school kind of getting ahead of myself a bit but uh, one day choosing up sides and uh, the teacher had uh, told two people that they could have uh, uh, to choose teams and the, the one who was to have uh, could have first choice uh, turned to the other one and said uh, no you go first well he says why would you want me to go first and he says well if I go first then I'll end up with doll. You go first. You'll end up with doll. 
And I took a lot of things like that, but, uh, and as I said, I wondered why I ended up with such a good self-concept when I took so much teasing and humiliation by my peers. But the reason was that whenever I went home, I knew that I was always loved and, and uh, nobody made fun of me there. And so home was a good place to go. I just remember home as being a very uh, happy and uh, secure place. We just had a little house, though. It was a one-bedroom home. And uh, as uh, the kids came, um, we eventually ended up there with, uh, there was five of us, myself and uh, Alan and Richard and uh, then Grant and uh, finally Rex. And uh, there wasn't room in the house for all of us with the one bedroom home. Uh, I remember we had a kind of a back porch and we'd sleep there and, and uh, we had a pull-out bed in the, the living room, but as we got a little bit older, Dad had a um, kind of a, a den out in the back. It was an outbuilding, and uh, w which was in the back. I, re I remember that uh, it, the walls were covered with cardboard. They were not covered with uh, wallboard that you would have now. But he had a lot of interesting things. He was a ham radio operator. He was into photography, and there was always some interesting. But they put a bed out there, and we slept there. And it had a stove that you, you could fire up. And then uh, he purchased, uh, which was right next door to us, an old photo studio. And, uh, and put two beds in there. And so then later we moved there, and that was closer to the house. It was just... Right, uh, you go out the back door and the door into this old photo studio was probably only about four steps. And uh, and that's where, uh, until we built the new home when I was uh, 14, moved yeah. into it in 1941. It was the 1st of November of 1941 that uh, we moved into the home up on Shear Street. Fifty years ago yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, it was, uh, I remember, uh, boy, how excited we were, because it was a two-bedroom home with a bedroom downstairs. And uh, we had enough uh, beds and, and uh, all under the same roof, and it was a new home, and I really felt like a rich kid. And uh, I had been, I'd had been able to help Dad. Uh, he basically... Uh, contracted the home and then subbed it out. And he let me work up there during the summer that we were building it. And uh, I got paid 50 cents a day. And I remember uh, just thinking that was so much money. And the Finnish carpenter that he hired, Brother James, George James, was paid 60 cents an hour as a Finnish carpenter. And I, th I couldn't believe a man would make a penny an hour, a penny a minute, a penny a minute. That seemed to me to be so much uh, money <laughs> that uh, he was paid. But, uh, uh, it was interesting that when we moved into the house, uh, the house was all paid for. Dad had been left some land by his father, some dry farm, and he'd sold that and uh, been able to move into the home. And uh, I think the cost of the whole house was about $2,500. And... Uh, but I remember really enjoying it. It was out, out in the country, and uh, Dad eventually got a cow and a pig and some turkeys, and uh, the cow was to keep us busy and to get us in milk. The cow, though, calved in August, and uh, by about November, the cow had dried up. We didn't do a very good uh -huh. job, obviously, <laughs> of milking her. And, uh, uh, but I don't think any of us felt bad, but Dad, <laughs> maybe Mom, but uh, um, I never got too excited about uh, milking the cow, and I guess we didn't do a very good job, but uh, nevertheless, I had that experience, and uh, uh, before we moved, uh, I would uh, go down and, 
and to help uh, uh, people would come to buy coal. And, and I remember there was an old Mr. Train that would come over from West Jordan that had a wagon and a team and, uh, of horses, and he'd let me ride the wagon and team down to uh, the, the coal yard, and I felt pretty important. And uh, then uh, when we moved up to uh, Shear Street, uh, most all the farmers at that time had uh, teams. Uh, Andersons, who had the farm across the street from us, they had a uh, uh, wagon and team of horses. Frank Pearson, who had the farm next to them and later became our bishop. Uh, and so at, uh, at that time, uh, while they had tractors, the horses were still the most common um, means of uh, running a farm. Um, also, I mentioned that Dad had a service station. I used to enjoy going to that service station. It had the old pumps, the gravity flow pumps that you you um, you you would sell the gas by the uh, the gallon, and uh, you would just look at it and as it went down, the uh, it was marked on the glass bowl. And then you would pump it oh, yeah. back up with a hand pump. But I felt very important, and I enjoyed that. And then Dad got the um, the job with Sinclair as a wholesale distributor, and uh, I really enjoyed going with him to to li deliver gas. You know, on Saturdays he would uh, let me go, and in the summer uh, to go with him to work. Always really felt uh, really important. Um, up until the time I was 16, I only remembered a period of about uh, three or four months when Dad wasn't in the bishopric. He was in the bishopric all the time, lived in the old Midvale Second Ward. And then when we moved to East Midvale, um, we moved uh, the 1st of November, but on January, and continued to go down to uh, the Midvale Second Ward, which was downtown. And then on January 1st, uh, he asked to be released, and then we started to go to the East Midvale Ward. I can remember the day that um, Sunday, December 7th, 1941. We had just been in the home a little over a month, though. Mom, for some reason, had not gone to Sunday school, and we'd all gone to Sunday school down to the Midvale Second Ward and, and drove into the, uh, the yard. We had a 39 Buick, black 39 Buick that Shirley and I... Uh, eventually inherited uh, some years later. <laughs> but uh, mother standing on the back porch and stated that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor and it looked like it was going to be war. And I remember how concerned and we were. And uh, also, uh, one of the young men, Jack Reed, in our ward, we found out in a couple of days, had, uh, he was in the Navy and was one of the casualties uh, there at uh, at Pearl Harbor. Hmm. Um, when we moved to uh, up on Sugar Street, 148 West 7200 South Street, um, that was a fun place because we had five and a quarter acres and uh, we would uh, go out and haul hay, had a nice garden and an orchard, and um, it was. Uh, uh, again, quite a different lifestyle than living down by the uh, the smelter. That's where I got my uh, my first uh, job. It was a morning paper out for the Salt Lake Tribune. Remember, we had 105 um, copies or papers to deliver. But uh, for those that are acquainted with that area. It went from 72nd South up to 64th South, where uh, Grandma and Grandpa Johnson used to live, and uh, along both sides of State Street, and then up 64th South to 13th East, with 3rd East and 7th East and 9th East in between, and then back down 7200 South, and so that was a, a pretty good uh, push. and. Uh, but as I said, we had uh, somewhere between 100 105 papers. The paper at that time cost a dollar and five cents a month, and we got to keep 32 cents of it, which is kind of 
about a penny a day about to deliver. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, <clears throat> went to the Jordan High School out in Sandy, and again that was um, uh, I would see myself as just basically an average student. I didn't get involved with uh, many extra things. I remember uh, my friend Van McClary, we would do a lot of things together, and uh, he was a pretty shy kid, although he could have been a tremendous athlete. And one day, I can still see going up to the uh, <coughs> the locker room door to go out for football and then he said oh let's not and so we turned around and and uh, never got uh, involved in in athletics in in any way and probably would not have done very well <laughs> with them but he was uh, kind of did what he wanted to do, and as I look back upon that, uh, well, he was a good kid. I wish that uh, maybe I'd gotten involved in a few other things. When I graduated, they had tryouts for um, uh, parts on the graduation program, and one of my teachers recommended I go down and try out, so I went down to the speech department. She had me read uh, for the speech, and I, I remember the speech teacher said, where have you been these last three years? <laughs> said, we could have used you with a voice like that and the projection that you have. And, and again, uh, that kind of made me feel bad because I had uh, basically did not do uh, any extracurricular activities when I was in uh, high school. Um, when I graduated from high school, I uh, went to the University of Utah, and uh, Remember what year that was? The year 1945. Oh, okay. Uh, World War II had just ended, and uh, all during the high school years, uh, <clears throat> they were kind of nervous years because you wondered, you know, is the war going to be over? Am I going to end up in the war? And I remember some of our uh, kids in our high school were actually drafted. When you became 18, you were drafted, even if you hadn't finished high school. And um, But the war ended the, uh, the summer I graduated. Hmm. It wasn't over when I graduated, but it ended that summer. And uh, so that fall, I started at the... Uh, and you the University of Utah. You turned 18 in October then? Yes. Oh, interesting. And uh, so I, I started at the University of Utah uh, that fall. Um, Dad had said on one occasion he would sure like to see one of his boys become an MD, and I thought, gee, that would be great. And so I went to the University of Utah and started a pre-med course. Uh, school didn't go well for me. Didn't seem to be able to do anything right. Uh, I remember that I took um, German and chemistry and English and freshman orientation. ROTC was mandatory and physical education. And uh, just really didn't do well. Uh, I would work hard. By that time, too, I was working at Stravel Patterson's, which was a wholesale hardware uh, company in Salt Lake where my Uncle Henry worked. <coughs> and uh, worked there with my cousin Dwayne Hill and uh, we were good buds at uh, that time and uh, and we were both going to the University of Utah and we'd work at Stravel Patterson's and then we'd go to shows together and do things together but school just didn't work out well and uh, I remember they called me in to uh, tell me that I wasn't doing well and they didn't have to do that. I knew it. It wasn't because I wasn't trying, but just nothing seemed to work out. They asked me to take a course, though, the next quarter in how to study. It was called Psychology One. And so I enrolled in that, and of all of the courses that I have taken, and I don't know how many, you know, through the bachelor's and two masters and the doctorate, I've taken a lot of courses. 
the only one I ever failed how to study. And I got so discouraged with that. And my cousin Dwayne was going to be um, drafted. My draft board out in Midvale said they wouldn't draft anymore because the war was over. He was in the Salt Lake draft board. So he's going to be drafted, so he said, let's enlist. And so we went up and, and enlisted, and it was a way of getting out of school. And when I left the University of Utah, I took a vow I would never go back to a college or university ever again, because it was not for me. And uh, I remember they had an 18-month enlistment at that time, so we enlisted for 18 months. They wanted us to enlist for three years. Stayed in Quentin three years. We'd get in the Air Force. And we would get some good assignments. We both said no, just 18 months. And <laughs> we got in the Air Force. And, and we were together down in Amarillo, Texas through basic training. And uh, I remember that that was a godforsaken spot. It was like uh, when we were there that uh, the wind was. Uh, blowing one uh, from the west, New Mexico would dr uh, blow by and uh, and uh, it was coming uh, from the east, uh, then Oklahoma would blow by and uh, just there on the old, in the panhandle. But uh, got through and it was interesting that the military did a lot to develop uh, my self-confidence. <laughs> when I got there, I was not the slowest individual <laughs> when, when it came to running. I still couldn't climb a rope, though. I still, but uh, the doll curse, I guess, with weak arms, because I, all my kids, I think, have ended up with the same problem, that they can't go up a rope. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> I remember when we'd go out over the obstacle course, they would yell at me because I had to get up these ropes and I couldn't do it. And uh, the sergeant said that that uh, nobody could stop until I got up. They weren't looking. I could sneak around, but they I got caught this one day. <laughs> so there were people up on top pulling and people down below pushing. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I finally got up and. Uh, but um, I got promotions just as quick as you could get them when I was in the service. And uh, well, I was there only a year and a half. I came out a, a sergeant, and uh, I had, uh, left uh, Amarillo and went to uh, Lowry Field in Denver, Colorado. And Dwayne Hill was also there. And uh, at Lowry Field, uh, they sent me to Clerk Typer School. We had typed for six hours a day, so I ended up really being a good typist. But that uh, had its assets too since I left there, because I've certainly used typing. And uh, and then when I graduated, was assigned to an air base that we're reopening in um, Casper, Wyoming. And uh, then du and Dwayne Hill was assigned to a a uh, Air base down in the Bay Area in California, and so we were separated at that time. Uh, we had some fun, though. Uh, I just throw in uh, one day they uh, we were on KP, and uh, we ended up with uh, the only roster that they had with all of the KP assignments, and we decided that if we got rid of that roster. Then uh, the sergeant wouldn't know who was really supposed to be there, and that we could probably sneak away early. <laughs> and so, but we decided, you know, what to do with the roster. Well, I can still see that there was a kind of a Waldorf salad with carrots and, and raisins and celery and, that we were mixing up, and so we took that, that roster and mixed it up <laughs> in, in the salad and. And it was uh, completely lost. Nobody knew where it was at. Nobody could find it. Looked high and low. And little did they know that uh, the troops were eating 
the Ross <laughs> that day in their, in their, their cell. And on another occasion, uh, Dwayne and I were, uh, it was when we were on KP, I was cleaning up, and it was the mess hall we were supposed to clean up, and really got boring, and so we decided to take a, a we had a mop and a, and a uh, hand brush, and so to use the mops, and then the hand brushes, the, the, uh, the hockey puck, and, and we were playing hockey when one of the sergeants came in and saw we were messing around, and I remember this had been a base that had been used all during World War II, and they just reopened it for basic training down there in Amarillo. And because of the, the cold, windy climate, that they had long entries uh, that you would line up in to go into the, uh, the mess hall so you didn't have to be out. And there were, they had written into the unpainted uh, uh, wood, soft pine, there were all sorts of, of names and epithets of the, I guess, of the hundreds and thousands that had probably gone through there during World War II. And I remember the, the sergeant came and he handed me a scrubbing brush and said, you don't leave until every one of these have been removed. <laughs> well, let me tell you, I would have still been there now <laughs> if, if they, they hadn't have uh, forgotten that... Uh, but uh, I guess I scrubbed for an hour or two, and then somebody came by and said that I could <laughs> go back to, to, the, uh, to the barracks. But as I said, I got promotions uh, uh, each time that it, uh, I'd been in a particular grade long enough. And, uh, and then we went to, to uh, Casper, Wyoming to a base that was to reopen. That didn't reopen and they sent me down to Roswell, New Mexico. There was a chief engineering clerk and I learned again, I just worked at a typewriter and I uh, got along very well with the engineering officer and uh, enjoyed the church down there and uh, the members. There was just a very small branch and uh, it was, uh, and so it was a a good uh, developing experience for me, the, the service was. I uh, spent the last uh, month uh, down in Tampa, Florida, at McDill Field, we were on maneuvers. And then my time was up, and so they had to send me back, and I can still remember our um, squadron commander coming up and almost pleading with me to stay in. I said, you're the type of people that we need in the, the military at this time. And, uh, but I had decided that no, I wanted to, to get home. And uh, one of the reasons I wanted to get home was uh, there, there was a lady missionary that had been stationed there and uh, I had enjoyed being with her. Uh, they transferred her and I down to Alamogordo, New Mexico and so I just hitchhiked down there one weekend to see her and then the next thing I knew that she'd been uh, transferred uh, clear over to Omaha, Nebraska where mission was big at that time. I was so naive I had no idea but her companion thought she was getting a boyfriend and and I guess in a, in a sense it was, because I just enjoyed being with uh, these sisters. There were not many active uh, LDS uh, at the base where I was at. In fact, there was no active uh, LDS singles. There was a couple of uh, married uh, individuals, but... Uh, uh, and there was... I remember one of my buddies from Idaho was LDS, but he was inactive. And, and uh, so it was just a fun place to go. Uh, we, uh, she got released about the same time I got out of the service. We were engaged for a short period of time. That did not work out. It was a great learning experience, and as I look back now, uh, uh, I'm certainly glad that it didn't work out because we were so different. 
Uh, when I got out of the service, I went to work for mine and smelter supply as an inventory clerk. And uh, was there from uh, when I got out of the service in October until I left on my mission, which would have been uh, in March. And uh, I remember when I got the mission call, well, I just make, uh, prior to, one of my good friends, John D. Smith, who right now is in the institute down in, uh, in uh, Thatcher, Arizona, we had gone to high school together, and uh, we'd been at the University of Utah together, and uh, I remember that I had only been uh, out of the service about a month, and the local paper had his picture, said he'd gone to Finland, and I thought, oh, that poor guy, <laughs> go to a place like Finland, because Finland, uh, at that time, everybody thought was under the thumb of Russia, and um, and in many ways they were. And uh, when my mission call came, I was working still at Mine Smeller Supply, but I told them to give me a call when it came. Uh, Dad was there, and he opened the, the letter up. I said, open the letter and read it. And he got so excited, he said, it doesn't even say where you're going on your mission. It just says you're supposed to do something when you're finished. And Mother was there, and she said, well, let me see that, Paul. <laughs> and she read it and said, well, Paul, it said he's going to the Finnish mission. And so, anyhow, uh, but it was interesting that when you get that call, you you feel good about it, and I felt really good about it. And, uh, I remember going up to the uh, the mission home that that time was located on North State Street, just up above the Eagle Gate. They took those buildings out uh, when they put in the. Uh, church headquarters, the high-rise there. And, uh, some nights you could go home because they didn't have enough room. I, I mean, it was a lot different than it was now, and you were there for a week and a half. And uh, then I went home for two weeks hmm. and until it was time to leave. And, uh, and uh, I can still remember uh, getting on the train down at the Union Pacific Railroad uh, station and there was a lot of members of the ward there to, and, and family to see me off. Uh, ward was really proud. I was. They had just created a new ward, the East Midvale Second Ward. And I was the first missionary to go out from, from the new ward. And, and, uh, and it was in those days that they had uh, big missionary farewells. I mean, you had a printed program and you'd invite people, and I remember they were hanging out the uh, the doors. There was not enough room to seat everybody. Some of Dad's uh, business uh, colleagues who were not members of the church uh, came, and they would take up collections, and uh, uh, I don't remember now exactly what it was, but it was really a healthy collection, and uh, it helped me to buy the clothes because you had to take clothes with you for two and a half years because you couldn't buy them in uh, Finland and they said to take extra food and I remember dad fixed up a big uh, box that we got down at uh, Allied uh, Surplus and <clears throat> loaded it with food and boy were my companions happy to be with me when we eventually got to Finland. I remember the big steamer trunk that we got that dad had had on his mission and then a couple of his cousins had taken it to Europe and repainting that and uh, and uh, taking the, the uh, steamer trunk. And uh, there were six of us that were going to Scandinavia. I remember one event that was kind of interesting to me that uh, it was kind of exciting to be on a train like that. I'd been on troop trains when I was in the service, but uh, this was a lot fancier. and. Uh, uh, but by the time we kind of got out in Kansas, things were uh, getting a bit boring, and so we pulled out the, our Bibles and were reading in the Bible, and I remember this individual come walking by, and he kind of stopped and cleared his throat and said, Excuse me, gentlemen, the curiosity has got the best of me. What would six young men your age 
uh, who are you? <coughs> You'd be sitting here on the train all reading the Bible. He said, I've never seen such a thing. He said, it's impressive. Well, one of us whipped out our article of faith card and handed it to him and said that we were missionaries for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Oh, the Mormons. He, he said, uh, and, and we told him we were going to Scandinavian countries. He said, uh, who's going to Sweden? And there was an elder Lundstrom from up in Idaho, and I mean, he was, uh, he was green. I don't think he'd ever been off the potato farm up there. And he said, oh, he said, I've been to Sweden. He said, uh, let's, um, let me tell you a bit about Sweden. And so he says, let's go up in the corner of the car. There's an extra seat there. And, and so they went up and we looked. And it appeared it didn't take him very long to tell him what uh, he wanted to tell him about Sweden. And then he uh, started asking about things about the church. And you could see him getting... I mean, the sweat breaking out. <laughs> there was an elder, Nielsen, or Nelson, he was from Los Angeles area. He'd kind of been given sabbath time, you know, that he'd been raised in the mission field, and he knew what things were all about, and we were so naive. And, and so uh, he said, I need to go up and save this guy. And he went up there, and he looked about as frustrated in another few minutes as, as the, the uh, elder from Idaho did. So the other four of us decided, well, we better go up to, to help our friends out. And we, we were not making a good showing. And I remember the man saying, he said, I really feel sorry for you. He says, you were so unprepared. And he was right. <laughs> and, he, and he said, but, but I have, I've been easy on you. I've been easy on you. And uh, wait till you get out in the world. But he said, I've got a solution. I've got a solution. He said, I'm president of the Cleveland Bible Institute, and this train's going right through Cleveland. He says, you get off. I wouldn't even charge you. But you come and spend a semester with me, and I'll train you in regard to the gospel. Then you'll be ready to go. And we said, well, that would be nice, but we had to catch a ship in New York, and, uh, and uh, we just couldn't do it. And I could just still see him walking away, nodding his head, and said, I feel sorry for you. <laughs> and he had a right to, because after I got to Finland, I, <laughs> well, I had a lot to learn. We uh, went to, to the uh, mission uh, or across the Atlantic on the Gripsholm, which was a Swedish ship. That was really a new experience to go on a luxury liner and all the meals and everything taken care of. Uh, the only problem was it was uh, uh, early spring. We were crossing in March, the North Atlantic, and it was very stormy. And uh, but once you got to custom, you know, after a couple of days of seasickness and everything was great. It took ten days to 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 cross. Landed in uh, Gothenburg or Yttebori, Sweden. Then took the train to Stockholm and then took uh, the boat from Stockholm over to um, Obo or Turku, Finland. And I can remember that night uh, it was an overnight uh, and going through the ice. Hmm. I heard uh, a talk by uh, President Meekham, the former um, mission president of the uh, Helsinki East Mission, talking about going to Estonia on a Russian ship and uh, going through the ice. Uh, well, I remember the same thing because uh, our um, room was up in the front of the ship <laughs> as the, that steel hull had hit that ice all during the night. We just finally went up on deck. We couldn't sleep. But uh, arrived in Finland, and it was dark and bleak and dreary, and because uh, spring had not come. Mission president, though, was there to meet us and uh, told me I was going to learn Swedish and uh, assigned me, though, to stay in that town, which was a Finnish-speaking town, and it got really discouraging because I never heard Swedish. And I had a companion that really didn't want to work. Uh, I would get so frustrated. He'd uh, say he was sick, and I felt so guilty that I just took tracks out. 
and uh, I got a little spiel together. I still remember it. You'd knock on the door, and the uh, first thing you would say is "Tala di svenska," or "Do you speak Swedish?" And uh, if they would say uh, "Nay," uh, they only spoke Finnish, then I would give them a Finnish track. And if they said, um, uh, respond, uh, responded in the affirmative that they spoke Swedish, then I say, "Jag uh, är en missionär från Amerika, och jag representerar Jesus Christi Turka, Sister Dagers Heliga. Jag har här en liten skrift som jag önskar att jag ska ta." Uh, det kostar ingenting uh, tack så mycket. Or in other words, I'm a missionary from America and I represent the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and I've got here a little track that I would like you to take that uh, doesn't cost anything and thank you very much. And that was the end. of. Uh, some of them were very friendly and wanted to talk and I would try to get through uh, with them but uh, I would go out and uh, it was like just passing out flyers, and I could go through many of them in a, uh, several hours, and I'd go out usually during the morning, and then when I came back, my companions had, had a sudden recovery and a note there that he'd gone to visit somebody, and then I wouldn't see him until night, and it was very frustrating. Uh, finally, though, I was transferred down into uh, the Honger Ekenes area in southern Finland, which is Swedish speaking. Never had there been missionaries there before. And uh, it was kind of a lonely feeling to go there where there were no members. And, uh, but uh, it, was, uh, it was a good experience, and I had a companion that wanted to work, and that's where I really felt that uh, my mission started. Finland at that time was so poor. I remember uh, you'd ride on the train and they had sheets made out of paper and my first meal at the railroad station in Obo uh, was oatmeal and I never did like oatmeal. There was no sugar, the milk was sour and uh, I thought, oh man, two and a half years of this. But those people were so warm and so gracious and we got us a uh, what they call a traveler's home it was a, it would just be a very inexpensive hotel. I guess what you would call a budget motel today. And I remember there was no uh, in, uh, toilet uh, facilities in the room. They had them down the hall, but you had the ceramic wash uh, bowl and and pitcher, and that's where you would wash. And and a uh, little pot under the bed that you need, could use to relieve yourself if you needed to during the, the night. And, uh, and so it was poor and it was like uh, going back to a, another generation right after the, uh, the war. Then I moved up to uh, Ersterboten up in the area of Larsmo and Jakobstad and, and uh, they were great people up there. Um, the language didn't come easy to me, though, and I remember <coughs> I'd been there, <coughs> I don't know, I imagine about six months, and I had gone out to Larsma where the district president lived, and or was assigned, he was just a missionary, but our district president and he said, congratulations, Elder, uh, President Mattis has just been here, and you have been called to be the branch president in Yonkerstown. Uh, and I was petrified. Branch president spoke every Sunday. He had to work with the members, and my language skills were not there. And in fact, I had never conducted a meeting. I gave a closing prayer. And I'd given a two and a half minute talk that took me a whole week to prepare, and then I had to read that. I thought, how am I ever going to do that? Larsmo was where Ezra Taft Benson dedicated Finland to the preaching of the gospel. 
And we had a little chapel there. It was the only chapel we we had in all of Finland. And uh, out in a field, or not a field, a forest, not far from the chapel was this large rock, and that's where President Benson had dedicated Finland to preaching the gospel. I remember going out there and pouring my heart out to the Lord and telling him, you know, I've really got a problem. I've tried to get this language, and now I've got this assignment, and I was so discouraged. I think I'd have gone home if I could have done. And, uh, but I poured my heart out to the Lord, and I could, it was almost the feeling that, uh, that uh, the Lord saying, well, at last uh, you felt my need. And I remember the, <clears throat> the greatest feeling that I had. It was such a warm, strong feeling that I knew everything was going to be okay. And I guess I would have to say it was probably really the first time that I really felt the influence of the Spirit. And uh, again, got another good companion. It was interesting that he could understand the people and I couldn't, but they couldn't understand him. But I was being blessed with real clarity of speech. And so we would go out and we were a real team. That uh, he'd tell me what they said and then I would talk back to the people. And, and it was interesting, though, how my vocabulary increased. And uh, eventually I got the language down really quite well. And uh, then I was made district president. And uh, it was almost, almost like a mini mission where we were at, because it was the only part that was Swedish, and you knew all the guys that were up there. There was about 12 of us that... Uh, you'd be a companion with every one of them and the, the cities where you would work were rather restricted but when the mission president came he didn't know the language he was finished speaking and so you'd translate for him and if you were interviewing members you'd have to go through and translate and and uh, when you were district president uh, you took care of all of the tithing funds and uh, you did counsel with members you counseled with missionaries it was a real maturing experience for me and uh, it was interesting, a good part of that time, I didn't even have a companion. I mean, things have really changed. I would travel from place to place, didn't have a companion. Hmm. Uh, but uh, great development. And I remember one day, though, that uh, I had got the... Um, so that I could speak really quite well. And I was at Jakobstad, this branch where they had made me the branch president when I couldn't even talk yet. And uh, I was visiting there, and so they invited me to talk. And I remember that as I got up to talk, it was just like everything became loose, and I could say what I wanted to say, and I could say it so clear, my tongue it was so loose, and my, my mind was functioning, and when I got through, I knew that I had given a great talk. And uh, members came up after and, and, and said, President Dahl, you sounded just like one of us. Uh, and boy, I know, knew that I had done good. And that whole week, I remember I just walking like I was 10 feet tall and uh, thinking, gee, you know, you've really arrived. You were really good. And, uh, you know, I didn't do much studying that week. And the next week, I was back at the same place for some reason, and, and so I was invited to talk again. I can still see myself moving up to that podium, you know, just almost with a, uh, arrogance. And starting off, you know, Minicheris, Cisco, and Yog are so glad at Varaheri Dog. Dear brothers and sisters, it's so good to be here today. And then my mind went blank. <laughs> I couldn't think, it just seemed like I stood there an hour, it was just a couple of minutes. Had to sit down. Never so humiliated in my whole life. And, uh, but I learned a great lesson there that day. And uh, the lesson was that, uh, I, in fact, 
as I was standing there, I could hear the Lord saying, Doll, if you want to take all the credit, you do it on your own. Hmm. And I've never forgotten that. And uh, hopefully I never have to go through that experience again. But, uh, but I know the Lord blesses you and will continue to bless you as long as you're humble about it. And you certainly give Him credit for part. And I had forgotten to, to do that. You know, it was all me. And, uh, but my mission was a great experience. Um, when I was released, the mission president uh, gave me a release. You were released and, and stated that my mission had been to the members and that I had been a good missionary and uh, but I never baptized one person. I would have baptized uh, one and my companion one because the two of us were teaching them. There were two that did come into the church. But I got appendicitis when I had uh, gone to a district president's meeting and down in actually in Turku were the first town that I worked. And uh, so missed the baptism. I got there the day after the, the next day and did confirm the lady. But uh, it was interesting that after I came home there were several people that wrote me and said that I was the first one that had, uh, they had ever, first Mormon they had ever met. And uh, that they were now members of the church. And so again, my mission was a, a good experience. It, in many ways, it changed my life and further developed my confidence that I had not had a lot of. And uh, the military did me a lot of good. The mission did me a lot of good. And so uh, when I came home, uh, remember I had taken a vow I would never go back to school, but Dad wrote and said, you've got the GI Bill of Rights now. That'll pay for your education. You need to, to at least try it. And so I thought, well, I'll go down to BYU. I'd been had some companions that said that was a great school. And, and um, I'll go down to BYU and try it for one quarter. And so I, I went down, and it was just completely different. And so I decided that uh, I wanted to be a teacher because we'd done English classes and I so enjoyed teaching and working with the young people in Finland. And so uh, uh, I just went through and uh, it was a, I never had any problems and, uh, and uh, I was going to teach uh, social sciences. I, I saw myself as a high school social science teacher and then one day my dad again said, have you ever thought of teaching seminary? And uh, I said, well, I really hadn't, but gee, you know, that sounds good. And so I applied, and, and uh, I remember going up to where the church education offices were, which would be in a building right behind the, the Hotel Utah, and again, uh, taken out when they put in the church office building. And uh, they had a stack of applications that seemed to be that high, and they put mine on the bottom, and I thought, well, that's the end of that. But I got a call from Joy Dunyon, who had been my seminary teacher when uh, I was at Jordan High School, and uh, said that he had checked in with my student teachers. And I'd had a good experience. I didn't real well in my student teaching and I got high recommendations there and said they would like to talk with me, had an interview. And uh, surprisingly I was hired. Mm. Um, probably the great event though that, uh, not probably, I know the greatest event that uh, took place would have been a, uh, I'd been, uh, fin finished the first year at BYU. And I had uh, gone down to southern Utah in the Grand Canyon 
with uh, some friends that I'd made. I'd made a lot of friends at uh, BYU that year and had had a great time in Lama Delta Sigma and, and uh, Delta Phi, the return missionary uh, uh, fraternity. And uh, it had just really been a fun year. I had gone out uh, a lot, uh, decided I need to to uh, learn to, to know uh, young women better. And uh, so I went out a lot. In fact, I, I, I kind of counted up at the end of the year. I wasn't trying to make any record, but I'd gone out with 40 different uh, uh, young ladies during the, <laughs> the uh, year. And, I, and I'd learned a lot. It was it was fun and and uh, when I had come back, uh, we had gone as soon as exams were over. We'd gone down to the, the parks and came back. I, uh, Bob Clark, who was a Finnish missionary, and we'd done a lot of things together, said, uh, I, "I want you to go with me on uh, Saturday night because I've got a a date, and uh, but I don't want to go alone." Uh, I just would like to have you go along because we have so much fun together. And I said, okay, I'll try and get a date. But I went back home and I didn't know anybody. I remember calling one young lady, Janice Jensen, that we'd gone through school for all 12 years together. And uh, and I'd taken her out a few times in high school and, and she said, well, uh, don't think it'll work out. I'm getting married in two weeks. So... Uh, <laughs> And uh, there was another gal that I had gone out with once and and uh, was in my parents' ward and and she just said that uh, she had to work. And so I told Bob I couldn't do it. And he said, well, I have uh, met uh, Arnold Isaacson's uh, sister, or Arnold Isaacson's, excuse me, Arnold Isaacson's girlfriend. And... Uh, Arnold was one of Bob Clark's missionary companions, and so he'd gone to visit uh, his girlfriend, and that was uh, Donna. And he said, I met her sister who just got back from a mission in Hawaii. And he said, let me call her up. And so he, he called her, and uh, Shirley had just been home a short time, and her parents had moved from Salt Lake out to Murray, and so she didn't know many people, and she said, but she'd met Bob the week or so before and wanted to get better acquainted with him. And so she accepted. And, uh, you know, I was really wondering what she was going to be like because I'd had a few blind dates before. And, uh, but I'll never forget, uh, it was at uh, Grandma and Grandpa's house there on uh, 64 South. And I can still see uh, Shirley as she came through the archway from the dining room into the living room. And she had on a turquoise blouse that her aunt had made and it had little white beads across the, the neck. And she had on a black skirt and it had a black uh, sash, you know, that hung down the side and, and, and black suede uh, sandals. And that smile that she still got. And, uh, and I thought, gee, this looks like this is gonna be all right. And we went to a um, to the old uh, Rainbow Rendezvous that uh, had moved into the had been the Coconut Grove in Salt Lake, a dance hall, and went to this Mel Torme conference or uh, concert. And it was just a great night. I had a lot of fun, and just when the night was over, I wanted to go out with her again, and and she had a lot of fun. And, and so we did a lot of fun things that summer. That summer I was working at Fuller Paints, that's uh, by Pioneer Park, uh, there in Salt Lake. And uh, But uh, we were doing something all the time. And uh, she was going to BYU that fall, and, and I was going back. And, but I decided that I knew that she'd be pretty popular when she got there and so then I better try to nail things down and, <laughs> and uh, so I asked her and and I think she was rather surprised and told her that uh, she didn't have to uh, give me an answer right then but if there was anything that I was confident was that her response was going to be yes 
and uh, but I didn't know. And she says, "Well, I don't know." And and uh, but anyhow, she says, "I need to think about it." And I don't know how much she struggled, but anyhow, the next day she said yes. <laughs> so I gave her my uh, my Delta Five pen, and and uh, we went back to school at BYU, and and that was a fun quarter. And then we decided to get married in December, and so on December 27th we got married, and and uh, that's how everything started. 1951, huh? Yep, 1951. If you want to keep going, you have another 50 minutes on the tape, and that would work fine if you want, if you have more to talk about. Well, <laughs> uh, she got about an hour and ten minutes, and you just got started, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, you know, there's a few other things that I uh, could talk about, because the, let me tell you, the, the Lord has really blessed me. Um, as I said, I enjoyed that fall. Shirley played um, for... At noon, she played for a dance class, and I uh, was living in a converted uh, coal room, and uh, and we had this old 39 Buick now that the folks had had, and uh, they gave it to Dick and myself, and so I bought Dick out, gave Dick a hundred dollars, and, and so that's how we got our first car. And, uh, but, uh, that fall, uh, we'd go, uh, to the, um, to the assemblies and the, the uh, devotionals that they would have at 11 o'clock, and, and then she had to play at, uh, it was Tuesday and Thursday at 12. And so I would run ahead over to, uh, where my room was and fix her a, a sandwich and get her something to drink and, and put it in a sack and then when we drove down to the old women's gym she would eat lunch and, and uh, but again it was it was fun uh, we'd go home uh, most weekends we loved to dance uh, we'd go to all the school dances went to the loved to go to the Avalon uh, ballroom which was out in Sandy and uh, then uh, when we got married uh, we moved in an apartment on 5th West and uh, I think it's 3rd North right on the corner still there and it was the center apartment and it uh, cost us um, $52.50 a month furnished I didn't know how we were ever going to make it. I got GI Bill. When I got married, uh, that went up to a hundred and five dollars a month, as I recall. And uh, I had carried mail that Christmas, made, uh, what was it, about seventy dollars? Maybe I'm exaggerating a bit there, but I think it was about seventy dollars. That's all I had to get married <laughs> on. Um, my folks paid the first month's rent, I think, or surely paid the first month's rent, and folks paid the second, as I recall. Um, but anyhow, we got going, and uh, surely got a job at J.C. Penney's. It was one of my missionary companions' uh, wife had had the job, and she was leaving the first of the January, and so surely went to work. We were married on the 27th of December, and she went to work on the 2nd of January. She still teases me about how quick I got her to work. <laughs> and she worked there at Penny's uh, a year. And uh, then uh, I uh, got a job. She suggested, I think it kind of bothered her when... I'd come home and, you know, just be studying or didn't have all that much to do some days. And she thought, 
it would be good for me to, to get a job. And so I got a job. And uh, it was interesting, my grades even got better. Finally we graduated and that summer moved up to uh, 64 South. And Wendell Day, who was an attorney, lived just down the street from Shirley's parents. Uh, they had a, a ranch in Wyoming and they spent most of their time up there. Wanted somebody to watch the house. So that's where we uh, spent our summer and uh, that's when Dave was born and I'll never forget uh, you know when he was born uh, we went over to the uh, Cottonwood maternity home we getting ready to leave and Shirley's mother was there to go and I I think I look back now this took a lot of courage and I, I just said we don't need you uh, this is our experience, and if I do need you, I'll give you a call. You know? <laughs> and she looked rather stunned, but she didn't go, and I'm really glad, because to me that was one of the, the great experiences. She couldn't go in, they wouldn't let you go into the delivery room in those days. But uh, We'd probably gone over somewhat earlier than we had needed to. It was all new to us, and, but basically we spent the whole night there in the labor room, and the doctor... He basically said uh, he, he was going to go to, down to sleep in a room that they had there, and uh, and the nurse uh, would check in periodically. But we, it was just a wonderful experience. And I remember when Dave was born in the morning, on that July 29th, and uh, it just so beautiful. The uh, Cottonwood Maternity Hospital was uh, it was just farms all around. I could still see the cows out the meadow and uh, the pasture there at the side. Beautiful morning, birds singing. You know, it's just, uh, even after all these years, it's really uh, still very vivid in my mind. Went from there, went down to Escalante. That was cultural shock for both of us. Uh, no paved roads. Felt like the real pioneers. We pulled the trailer in there, and it was interesting that there had been floods, and we had to ford about three streams to to get in. Rented a home for uh, I think that it was uh, thirty-five dollars a month, furnished for the piano. <laughs> and uh, all these people had pianos and no teacher, and Shirley came, and we uh, at the end of our first month. Paid all of her bills, had no money left over for food. And that's when Shirley started giving piano lessons and gave the next 30 years. And uh, um, basically, she, uh, as a family, she fed the family. And uh, I was really nervous going down, and I learned a lot about myself, though, and it was a good experience. I did some good teaching, and, and uh, supervisors would come. The, those days, the classes all seemed to, to be the good classes. And uh, But it was interesting. There was no doctors. You'd go to Sister Willis, the public health nurse, and she'd give you a shot. She'd call into Panguitch and get instructions from the doctor there, and then uh, would... Uh, give you a shot, usually a penicillin shot, or she had some medications that she had kept there, because there was no drugstore, there was no bank, no dentist, no supermarket, <laughs> and, uh, but good people, good people. They'd asked us to go for two years, at the end of two years, they, uh, there'd been a, a John Mooney, who was the Tribune uh, sports writer, had talked about going down through southern Utah. And when you came to Escalante, that was really the end of the road. And so I clipped out this article, and I sent it to William E. Barrett, who was over Seminary and Institute, reminded them that two years were up, and that we would uh, like to transfer. And we didn't care where we went, but we did have some basic things that we would like. We would like to go where there was a Safeway store. 
we put a Safeway store because they were the only supermarkets that, at that time that we were aware of. And uh, <laughs> that there be a bank and a doctor and a hospital and a dentist and a drugstore. <laughs> and uh, I was still going to school on GI Bill. My GI Bill got me through the bachelor's and just about finished uh, master's degree. So I was going to school that summer and I needed to get a letter from William E. Barrett to certify that I had taught all year so that they I could get uh, GI Bill during the summer. If you hadn't have taught all year it would have lapsed because you had to I was getting to the point that it had to be used up on a continuous, continuing basis but if you're a teacher and uh, certified that you taught that year, then they would let you go just for summers. And so sent me, he sent me a, a, a carbon copy of a letter he sent to the Veterans Administration that said that Paul Dahl, one of our teachers, has spent the last year as a teacher in Escalante and will be um, teaching the coming year in Cedar City. And that's how we found out. Oh, really? <laughs> and we were so excited because we had been to Cedar City and it was a nice little town and we were just ecstatic and uh, church education had really come a long ways at that time uh, as I recall they said uh, we'll pay for the gas if you can get a friend to move you and we got a friend that moved us over in his cattle truck but Cedar was good um, we moved into a little place that was a converted granary at Jones's um, Shirley had said she'd be willing to go to Escalante as long as we didn't have any more kids because it weren't while we were there because there was no doctor. David was a month old to the day when we moved into Escalante. Greg was six weeks old when we left. Hmm. It was an interesting experience when Greg was born. Uh, I had promised her if uh, she would stay down there and have the baby that I'd go visit her every day in the Panguitch, and, and that's a pretty good drive from, uh, I figured out that I traveled about 940 miles to visit her in the hospital, and uh, and the guys in Escalante looked at me like I was crazy. They would take their wife over, and when they had the baby, and they kept them for about five days then, would uh, come back and, uh, or, and then they would just tell the wife, call up when uh, you're ready to come home and we'll go get you. But I kept my promise. I went over every night. and uh, and uh, But Greg was doing a lot of sleeping, and so we had to leave him there. Shirley could come home. And uh, he had to stay another five days. And they had this private telephone company in Escalante. It was a crank phone. <laughs> and uh, when, um, when you know that... Uh, the telephone line went down. There was only the one line, and Brother Lyman, who owned the telephone company, also worked at a sawmill, and so he was gone during the week. And if the phone line went down, you didn't have any phone till the weekend when he would come and then get on his horse and ride the line to find it <coughs> broken. But the mail would come in every day, and I remember it was a man by the name of Macinelli, and we were down to the waiting for the mail to come in. That was really the big event in Escalante every day when the milk came in, or the mail. Also the milk. They, they, uh, the first milk they started to bring in, uh, bottled uh, homogenized milk, was for David. They had never had milk brought in to Escalante mm. before then. and We'd made the request, so they started it. But anyhow, the, the mail truck was there, and McAnally came up, and he said, Hey, doll. I was by the hospital over in Panguitch. You can pick up your kid any time. <laughs> it was sort of like you left a car in for repairs in your car. <laughs> so the next day we drove over with another couple, the the Munsons, that uh, uh, had had a baby, um, or with uh, Laurel. I mean, that, and so that uh, he went over with us and. And he picked up his wife, a new baby, and, uh, and so because uh, their car was broke down, and so we brought the two new babies back, and 
the, it was amazing. The bill was uh, for five days, extra days for Greg in the hospital was ten dollars. That's difficult to believe. Uh, <laughs> ten dollars. Uh, Two dollars a day, and uh, boy, how times have changed since 1953. Well, we went to Cedar City and started in the seminary there, and uh, seminary again was good. When I had been hired, they'd asked me if I was interested in teaching institute. I had told them that, uh, no, I'd only thought about seminary, and they said, well, good, we don't want you to be disappointed. And uh, I said, uh, no, uh, I never, ever thought about that. And, and they said, well, you know, our men are young, and uh, there's not much expansion, and they enjoy the work. And, and some people see Institute and, uh, and they'd be just disappointed because there's no places. Uh, the spring of the first year I was there, Paul Felt, who taught in the, the Institute right next door, came over and said, would you be interested in teaching spring quarter uh, an afternoon class at the Institute? And I said, oh, I'd love to. And come to find out, I think he was just kind of checking me out. And I taught the, the class, and it wasn't a large class, but uh, it was a fun class, a good experience. And uh, he called me in and said, you know, I've been checking with people in the class, and they think you're a good teacher. I'm going to request you for third time next year. I was ecstatic. And uh, yeah, they approved it. Hmm. And so I thought, taught Institute third time. But here it was, my, my third year. I taught my first institute class. Fourth year, I was third time. Fifth year, I was going to go half time. And he got approval for that. And uh, But then he took a, t a job at BYU. And he came to me and said, Now, Paul, don't get any ideas about being the institute director. <laughs> And I said, I'm not. I, am I going to be able to stay half-time next year? He says, yeah, you'll be able to stay half-time, but you won't be the director. You're too young. You're too inexperienced. That summer, I got a job working up on Cedar Mountain for the Forest Service. I'd drive down every night, and this one night I had driven down, and Shirley said, Boyd Packer wants you to call him. He was one of the, the uh, administrative assistants to William E. Barrett at that time. And so I called Boyd, and uh, he said, well, uh, what do you think of the new institute director? I said, I don't know. I haven't met him yet. And he says, you haven't met him? that strange. I thought, sure, you would have met him. I said, uh, you know, I've been wondering, uh, uh, you know, when uh, he would be coming or when I would hear. And he said, that's strange that uh, you haven't met him. You don't know him. And he said, and I said, well, you know, not, not, not that I'm aware of. And he said, well, I'm talking to him. And I was just stunned. <laughs> because, you know, some things you kind of think about, would there be any chance? And, and I never even passed my mind. I had taken literally what Paul Feld had said, you're, you need more experience. And I said, you're, you're kidding. He says, no, we've approved you to be the institute director. Well, here was one of the really nice institute assignments, and here I was my fifth year, and here I am now in my 39th year, and with the three years that I was at BYU, I have been an institute director every year since then. By far the, the more years as institute director of any man in the church education system today. <clears throat> but again, it's been a good life. Um, I enjoyed it very much working there with Frank Day, and, and uh, it was a uh, good experience. Uh, I had gone down to St. George to take some books to the institute director down there, and uh, he had uh, talked about how he was going to get a doctor's degree. Well, I just finished up my master's degree in church history at that time, and we bought our <clears throat> little house on 150 West there in uh, Cedar City. 
and uh, we were just very comfortable. And I said, uh, I'm just happy where I'm at. I don't even care if we uh, 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 ever went any other place. And I've got a master's degree, and he says, oh, no, he says, you've got to get a, or I'm going to get a doctor's degree because these younger men are going to pass us by. I remember driving back talking with Shirley and said, you know, we're really set here. And she agreed. We were happy. And this Saturday afternoon, Monday morning, I'm there at the Institute. The phone rings. Pick up the phone. <coughs> Boyd K. Packer again. And he said, Paul, we got a new assignment for you. They wanted us to go out at the uh, University of Oregon. They were just opening an institute there and getting it going. And so I went home and told Shirley about it. Her response was, as always has been, I think we need to go. We need to go. So we went up there. And it was interesting that Sam was born in Cedar City and got up to Eugene. And boy, were we poor there because I was on half salary. And some real adjustments living in the institute. And John's born while well, we're there. We're only there two years, move into a new home in, uh, over Labor Day. Then in February, t told that I'm going to have to move and want me to move to Boise. And uh, I didn't know how we were ever going to sell the house, but uh, through a miracle, we did. And again, uh, when I humbled myself and did some good fasting and and prayer, got a confirmation that we would sell the house, and uh, almost like a miracle that, because uh, houses weren't selling, but the teacher came in and had just come into the area from and, and bought the house, and in fact even moved us to Boise. And, uh, and then Boise was a good experience institute-wise. I never really felt part of the community. The, um, Church-wise, I was never asked to do much. I think they really didn't know how to deal with me. Thought that uh, the institute was my church calling, but I never had a more satisfying institute assignment. We had uh, a good-sized program and uh, really kept me busy. And that's where Paula comes. And then we go to BYU and uh, let's see. It would have been in. Uh, we went to uh, Eugene in 1961, and uh, Boise in 1963, and then they approved the sabbatical, went to BYU in 1966, and was there in 69, when I finally finished up my degree there and got my doctorate in marriage and family therapy. And uh, they went down to uh, Tucson. And uh, <clears throat> didn't pick up any more souvenirs after Boise that I remained family <laughs> remained at uh, five. And Tucson was a good experience, and most of you remember well that area. I think the miracle was that all five of the kids graduated from the same high school, Sora High School. It was good to us. A great opportunity and certainly the great blessing of being a state president in such a great state with such good people. And then the great shock that comes though when again the phone call and uh, <coughs> noon on Wednesday, February 29th, 1984. The, uh, my secretary said, uh, Frank Day's on the phone and wants to talk with you. And I get on the phone, and there's uh, yeah, Frank Day was there, but also um, um, Stan Peterson, who is the overall seminaries and institutes, and, and Frank Bradshaw and Bruce Lake, who are two um, zone administrators. And again, said that they had a proposition for me and they wanted me to go to 
to Harvard. I couldn't believe that. Asked him how much time I had to, you know, make up my mind, and uh, he said, take a week. I went home and told Shirley, and and uh, could hardly get Harvard out. Harvard out. I was uh, so excited. I think I said, ha, 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 Harvard. I stuttered. Uh, they, they want me to go there and, and to the other schools in the area. And I remember her first response was, well, we ought to think about it very seriously because uh, uh, if we turn it down, we'd probably always wonder what we had missed. Uh, about two hours later, I'm back at the Institute. She had piano lessons, and we we're going to talk more about it that night. My secretary, and here's Boyd Packer again. Notice how often he comes up. <laughs> and uh, said, that Elder Packer, who's now a member of the Quorum of the Twelve, wants you to uh, uh, give him a call. And and, uh, and so I pick up the phone and uh, get him immediately. And he says, well, have you made up your mind yet? And I said, well, I've only known for two and a half hours. And he said, well, that's enough time to know about going to New England. But ironically, he was coming to our state conference that weekend, and I'd known that for six weeks. In fact, we made all the plans, but he said, seriously, I need to know by tonight if you're going, because if you're going, I have to have it on the agenda in the temple meeting in the morning, which is Thursday, to get their approval to release you. And if you're going to go, you need to release this Sunday because the next conference doesn't come until after you have begun. And I said, but Elder Packer, my kids are scattered all over the West. He said, well, I'll be home late. Just let me know tonight. We did a lot of calling, and, and the family seemed supportive, and, and so we left. And, uh, the next Sunday I was... Uh, or, uh, it, it, the next Sunday I was uh, released to state conference and, and then we left that summer and uh, but what uh, gee they were five uh, outstanding years uh, opportunities that uh, I could not have dreamed of back there and uh, it would have been really sad to have missed uh, that experience and then after five years, we asked to get closer to our family, and so here we are in San Diego, which again, this, uh, I mean, this is like paradise weather-wise. And so the Lord has uh, really uh, blessed us through these years. And when we were in Boston, it was a wonderful experience, too, to be the bishop there of the uh, university Ward. A lot of challenging uh, young people, but they were they were fun. They were stimulating. And uh, an interesting thing, I think many people in the church are are very suspicious of bright people, intelligent people. And uh, the one thing that I found out there, that, uh, even though they were very bright, and some would be lab labeled, as we label sometimes, as I think unjustifiably, uh, as intellectuals. I was always amazed at their commitment to the church and uh, willingness to go on missions, to accept calls. And, uh, and so, you know, it was a real broadening experience. But now it's good to be here, closer to the family, and. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> to be able to visit them, and not so far to to have to go. And, and here I am now in my 39th year with church education. I just had my 64th birthday. And uh, just uh, as I look back, I don't know where my life has gone, but it's been a good life. And certainly one of the things that's made it so good is to have uh, such a sweetheart to be married to. And here, I can't believe 40 years is coming up next month. Next, it will be 40 years that we have uh, 
been married, but uh, they've been 40 good years. And our kids, uh, gee, each one of you have uh, been so good as I counsel with people and all of the problems that they have. I can't think of one of you that was ever a serious problem. And the great thing about it was that you you were always uh, active. I mean, you had a lot of spirit. And uh, <clears throat> but uh, you just brought nothing but uh, happiness and joy to us, and you continue to do so. And now it just continues now as we've got. Uh, 15 beautiful grandchildren. And I guess I would just uh, conclude by saying that uh, the Lord's been good to me. In fact, I don't know of anybody that I really envy in regard to, to family and uh, boys have all married so well. And uh, I love each one of their wives. Some people talk about having favorites. Talked with Shirley about this, and um, um, I could never come up with a favorite. I just uh, enjoy every one of my kids. Um, different personalities, but uh, just thoroughly enjoy being with uh, each one of them. And I know, though, that the, the blessings have come through trying to um, to follow the gospel. What a great um, helper. And I would have just shuddered to think of having to raise a family in this troubled world with, without the gospel. And Shirley and I have talked about this many times. And so the Lord has blessed me, and I would just conclude with uh, knowing that the church is true, that uh, and great blessings come from being obedient and being willing to take assignments. Uh, I wouldn't be, you know, near the person that I am. Certainly, I've got room for a lot of improvement, but I wouldn't be near the person that I am if it were not for the gospel and the opportunities it's given me. I know that Christ lives and the gospel's been restored and that we have a living prophet and I'm thankful for all of this. We're saying in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Thank you.